Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second annual Veterans Day event. Um, please rise for the national anthem and the posting of the colors. Chapter Color Guide, please advance the colors. <coughs> Please be seated. Good afternoon, friends and colleagues, Bay State leadership. Please join me in a moment of reflection and invocation. We have gathered here today at Bay State Medical Center in the spirit of community and unity. We come together filled with deep gratitude and humility as we pay tribute to this nation's veterans. Holy One, source of our hopes and blessings, we give you thanks for our veterans. Generation after generation, young men and women have answered this country's call and their lives have been changed forever. We honor the women and men for their faithful service to this country and for what they have done to protect and defend our Constitution and us. 
We honor their dignity and their commitment. We pay homage to their valor and courage. We give thanks for their lives. Today, we especially honor our fellow colleagues at Bay State Health who have served in the armed services. We give thanks for their deep and generous commitment to dedicate their lives and service for others at Bay State and in the armed services. A holy one of blessing, you have gifted those who serve this country with a special strength and a sense of commitment. We are grateful to all who have served, whether in peacetime or in conflict. They who have given so much their lives and their limbs to uplift democracy and freedom. We remember all those who continue to bear wounds of the body or the spirit as a result of what they endured. Holy one of many meanings, we pray that their wounds will heal and that peace will return to their souls so that they may return fully to their families and their communities. Bless all veterans and their families. On this Veterans Day, O Holy One, bless those who currently are serving in our armed services. Keep them from harm's way wherever they serve in the world or in this country. Bless them on land and in the air and on the sea. And bring them home in safety to their families and friends. May we never forget what this country has asked of the veterans and what they have given in return. Help us to give them the respect and honor they are due. A holy one. Help us strengthen our resolve to build a world of peace and justice. Bless this country, that it may be a stronghold of peace and its advocate among the Council of Nations. So be it. Amen. Shalom. Thanks, Uta, for those wonderful words. First off, I'd like to thank all the veterans, their families, and loved ones that are here today for your service and your uh, sense of duty to your country. I appreciate that. And I'd like to thank everyone else who came here to support them. Um, this is our second year of doing this event, and uh, we learned a couple lessons from last year. Um, one of them is we spend too much time thanking people, and I will accept that feedback unapologetically because as veterans, we were so thrilled to finally have a day to be recognized here in, in our workplace um, that we sp did spend a, probably a disproportionate of time. So I'm going to keep the thanks in public very short, but um, I do want to make sure that everybody knows how much we appreciate all the effort that went into making this day fantastic. Um, so I also, one of the lessons learned is we got this on the calendar early enough, we could have our president's cabinet here, so we have our CEO and most of our senior leadership team, as well as some of those actually speaking today, so thank you for that. Um, one of the other feedback I got was I, I showed a clip last year of a speech from Ronald Reagan during his presidency, which I thought was actually pretty, pretty appropriate. Got some feedback, not everybody appreciated as much as I did. They said, we'd much rather hear a little bit about your story, Mike, so I'm not gonna take too much time, but I will honor that request with a, with a little bit of information. So um, in the, I was a naval officer, Lieutenant CEC USN, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because while there's, um, we're all brothers here today in, in, in the uniformed services, um, and we have some inner service rivalries, not everybody understands all the inner workings of, of each branch, and, and I was in a particularly small branch within the Navy, so I'm gonna talk about it for just a minute. Um, in the, in the US Navy, they have sort of line officers and staff officers, and on the, on the left, you see the line officers. Surface warfare officers are the ship drivers. Aviation officers are the pilots. Submariners are pretty obvious. Naval Special Warfare is the SEALs and some other um, spec ops within the Navy. And then the EOD, or the Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Those are line officers, and on their uniforms, um, they're gonna have stars above their stripes, and, and I've got a couple pictures of uniforms I'll show you. On the right is the Staff Officer Corps, and that's made up of all of the different branches that you see, the Chaplain's Corps, the Dental Corps, Judge Advocate General, which are the lawyers, Medical Corps, Medical Service Corps, Nurses Corps, Supply Corps, and then finally what I was in, the Civil Engineer Corps. We have a slightly different um, you know, insignia on our uniform that I'll show you. 
One, one thing that I think is really important, and, and I guess I, w I do want to sort of recognize is, for all the Marines in the audience, um, happy birthday. Yesterday was their birthday, their 239th. Um, one of the things that's so special, I think, about the military is how much we honor traditions. And uh, Dr. Kerouac challenged sort of Jen Faulkner in her new role to sort of bring back some of the traditions at Bay State that we sort of have either forgotten or failed to continue or maybe start some new ones to really make it special. The Marine Corps, I mean, the, the military really understands traditions and that's why they sort of never forget history. But here's some key dates just to sort of longevity in, the, in some of the different programs. So the Navy was launched first on October 13th, 1775 followed you know, literally a couple weeks later by the Marine Corps. And my friends in the Marine Corps, which um, always don't like to me remind this, but the Marine Corps is actually part of the Navy. And you know, they have a separate spot on the, uh, you know, on the sort of the symbol that we use, but they are part of the Navy. So we're proud to have them as part of the Navy. But the Civil Engineer Corps, which I was part of, um, which goes back to 1867. And you probably don't know much about the Civil Engineer Corps. I'll just talk about that briefly. But hopefully you've heard a little bit more about the Seabees. Um, they were started back in March 5th of 1942. This I remember as a kid, John Wayne and the Fighting Seabees. I believe this was a late 60s vintage uh, movie. It was pretty famous. You know, you see him in, in, in his uniform was all greens. This was back in the day before um, the Navy wore camo. The, the Seabees started with a utility green uniform that was all green. And um, I didn't know what the Civil Engineer Corps was. When I, when I, um, I went into the, I, many of you know, I went to, went to the Naval Academy and I had aspirations of being a pilot. Um, I thought I would be a Marine Corps pilot, so I, that's why I say I have great affinity for the Marine Corps. Um, realized quickly with some allergies and some other things, I probably wasn't gonna be able to be a Marine uh, pilot. So I figured, okay, I'll just be a Marine. And then to my chagrin, my pre-commissioning physical at the end of my um, first semester senior year, they said, you're, you're gonna be a restricted line officer um, because you have you know, asthma and you have allergies. And I, I was devastated. Um, I figured if I couldn't be sort of an uh, unrestricted line officer, you know, I didn't wanna be one of those other core programs. And um, I was pretty dejected, couldn't be a Marine, couldn't be you know, a line officer. And they said, well, Mike, you're an engineer. Why don't you go in the Civil Engineer Corps? And I'm like, what's that? And they said, the CVs. And I said, oh yeah, I kinda know what that is. Um, so I, I learned a little bit more. And like anything else, the, God has a plan. And I ended up getting commissioned in the Civil Engineer Corps. And as opposed to a star on our uniform above our stripes, we have this insignia with, um, gold, with oak leaves and the, uh, the acorns. And each of the different corps have a slightly different version. Mostly the acorns are kind of in there, but the JAG Corps has a slightly different one, et cetera. But that was, that was the, the group that I was in within the, within the Navy and in the Staff Corps. Um, but this is the Seabees. And where this name came from is, it was started off as the Naval Construction Force. And then within that force, when that was, when that was designated um, in 1942, they were the embodiment of that force was made up of construction battalions. So they took the CB from construction battalion and they turned it into this. And the motto is we can build and we can fight. And you can see they got machine gun in one arm and wrenches and hammers in another. And that's really the motto. Um, and it, along with can do, that's what the CBs are known for. Anything that sort of gets asked, you know, over in the desert, you know, they're the ones that built the tent city, the water plants, all that kind of stuff. Um, we can build and we can fight and we're pretty proud of that. And I can tell you that in 2017, when we hit our 75th birthday, I guarantee you there's gonna be sort of celebrations throughout the country and throughout the world because some of the most pride, uh, proud folks in the military are our CBs. So um, the other thing that's unique about the Civil Engineer Corps and the CBs is that despite being sort of a part of the Staff Corps, they actually have a warfare qualification. Um, and what that really means is, you know, all the different services have different ranks, depending on the uniform. The Navy, we have stripes on our service dress blues. We have stripes on our whites. Um, above the medals that you see people wear, there's always a metal, um, a metallic, you know, symbol there. The pilots have wings. The surface warfare officers have what's called their SWO pin, um, their qualification. The submariners have their dolphins. And the CBs petitioned, um, because of the work in the battalions and the roles they played in various wars, that they should get their own warfare qualification despite being sort of part of the Staff Corps. And they successfully did that in, I believe it was 1993. And the only way you can get that is to serve in the actual um, CBs deployed in a battalion. So as an officer, we have three roles in the Civil Engineer Corps. We're either doing construction management, we're doing public works, or we're doing, you know, deployed with a CB unit. Um, I did not achieve this qualification because I didn't have the opportunity to serve in a battalion before I got out. Um, but they retroed it for some folks who had served prior to. 
But getting your warfare qualification is probably one of the most important things in the Navy. Um, if you don't achieve that by the time you're a lieutenant, you're not gonna promote to 04, which is lieutenant commander in the Navy. So um, it's really important stuff, and I'm pretty certain that we're the only part of the Staff Corps that actually has a warfare qualification, and that's really, really important to us. Um, this, this goes back, this is the sort of pictures everybody wanted to see. So this is uh, 1988. 1988, uh, 22 years old. Um, that was my uh, ensign, you know, commissioning picture. So um, you, you can say you've seen it. Um, this one is a few years later when I was overseas in Siganella. My oldest daughter, many of you know, was born there. That's Lindsay. She's probably about a day old. I was in my greens there. That was before we switched to camis. Um, I'll just tell you a brief story about you know being overseas. Sig Sicily is a volcanic island, and um, the, the ground is, you know, when it gets wet, I don't remember if it's acidic or caustic, I should probably know, but either way, it eats anything that's buried. And we literally probably almost daily, if not three to four times a week, we had some sort of a water pipe break or some other break. And in, in my team in the public works, we had, I had about 220 folks back then, about 110 um, enlisted civil, uh, CBs and another 100 um, local national Italians that were in, in my charge. And we were constantly digging up the base. We had several bases actually, but mostly the, the sort of administrative base, if you will. We had an airfield on one, we called it NAS-2, and uh, the sort of home base where the commissary and the housing quarters and everything was, was Naval Air Station NAS-1. And the hospital um, was, was um, on NAS-1. So we had kind of waited to, to have our baby because prior to this hospital being built, the expectant mothers had to fly up to Naples, which was about a two hour plane ride on a small prop plane um, to go to um, the, the base there. And we called it the stork's nest. And then the fathers got to go up three days before the due date. And as you can imagine, the likelihood of those things coinciding were pretty slim. So I didn't want my wife going to Naples alone. I didn't want to miss the birth of my child. So we made sure the hospital was constructed and opened in January. And my daughter was born in October, so we didn't take any chances. But um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I was coming from a dig, um, trying to repair some broken pipes someplace, and that's why I was in my greens that day. And I talk about pride. Um, this was the last CB ball I was in when I was overseas. So um, the 90s called, they want their hair back. But my wife and I had a really great time. I was amazed the number of photos I found sort of with me with that, well, I didn't quite have the smile on this one, but some of the ridiculous smile on my face reminded me how much fun I had in the military. So. This is my brief uh, salute to the Civil Engineer Corps, the CBs, and again, thank you all. And I'm gonna now um, introduce some of the few people I do really wanna thank. <clears throat> um, because last year, this was an impromptu function. We were sort of challenged, appropriately so, by my friend Jason Newmark and uh, um, one of the other ERGs to sort of form something for the veterans. So we kind of did it ad hoc. But we have a full-fledged ERG right now. And um, it's being led right now by Dennis O'Brien, Major, um, U.S. Army, retired. Dana Dupuy, <laughs> Master Sergeant, retired, U.S. Air Force. James DiNonato, RM2 from um, the Navy. And Kathy Snow is our treasurer um, for the, uh, the leadership team for the Honor Guard. So I would like to thank those four people for their leadership and putting this event together today. So yes, please stand. Next up, I'd like to introduce the first of our two keynotes, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, Dr. John Schreiber. It's a privilege to be here, and I have to say, um, I've been at three institutions in my 30-year career, and this is the first institution that's done this for Veterans Day, and I have to thank Bay State Health. It is uh, remarkable to this, so thank you, Dr. Kerouac and Bay State Health for doing this. Uh, I had some stuff to say, but Mike's going to delay a little bit because he, he kind of laid the gauntlet on the ground, you know, the birthday of the Navy, 239 years and all that. And that's the reason when you stay in officer quarters at the Air Force, which started in 1948, they're actually nice. The Navy's officer quarters are 239 years old, and they, and they, they kind of look it. So I just want to, you know, push, push, back, push back just a little bit on the Navy stuff, okay? Uh, so um, I actually was a flight surgeon uh, for first at Westover years and years ago for C5A unit and I remarkably met somebody, Chief Master Sergeant Kudla was the reason I survived my time at Westover and I met his daughter who works here, which just stunned me the other day. You know, it's a, it's a small world, the circles come around. 
We moved to Ohio and I was assigned to a C-130 unit. Uh, we were deployed all over the world. In Desert Storm, uh, we had orders to go to Iraq um, and uh, the airplane diverted to Scott Air Force Base on the way to Iraq, true story, Scott Air Force Base in Illinois, where I spent 89 days in the Comfort Inn in O'Fallon, Illinois, t <laughs> taking care of uh, all the casualties for Desert Storm that were all three days old, and that was my experience there. But I didn't really want to talk about myself. I wanted, you know, you read in the newspapers and veterans are a voting block, or they're this or they're that, and they, they use the word veterans, you know, and they're a political tool. Uh, veterans are people, and every veteran has a story to tell. And the stories change your life. And I'm going to read you a story um, uh, that was given to me, a letter that was given to me in May 1994. It has significance in that uh, this is the 70th anniversary of D-Day this year. And uh, the letter was written on the 50th anniversary of D-Day. So bear with me. Uh, I'll, I'll stay with them in my time, Mike, I think. Uh, dear John, Becky, Nate, and Jake, I'm sure that you both have heard about the 50th anniversary of D-Day, which was the invasion of Normandy in Europe on June 6, 1944, in the attempt to liberate Europe from the devastating tyranny of Adolf Hitler and his Nazis. The invasion was one of the most phenomenal and costly in history and included more than 150,000 Allied soldiers. Grandpa was there on D-Day. When World War II involved the U.S., I joined the Army in 1942, 21 years, by the way, 21 years old, and I was assigned to an Army division called the 82nd Airborne. This division was newly formed and consisted mainly of paratroopers, soldiers who parachuted out of low-flying airplanes behind enemy lines, and the paratroopers were supported by in infantry and small artillery carried in gliders, which also landed behind enemy lines. Although it was desired that we qualify for both duties, on that day, D-Day, I had to go into combat in a glider. The gliders were made of wood or fabric over tube aluminum, were pulled by large bombers or transports, and were cut loose over the landing zone, which we would call the crashing zone. The gliders were, of course, very slow in speed, flew at very low altitudes, and were great targets for the enemy. At 9 a.m. on D-Day, I was in the lead glider and as we crossed the English Channel and flew over Normandy, we received intense anti-aircraft and machine gun fire. I remember looking at the floor of the glider and seeing bullet holes coming towards me, meaning, of course, that a machine gun was getting close. Just as I thought I was about to get hit, we crashed into a tree, and most of us fell through the floor of the glider to the ground. I later discovered that that was fortunate we had crashed. Since we had, if we had landed in a cleared field, we probably would have hit many of the thousands of mines that the Germans had set in those fields. I remember hitting the ground without injury, but at that instant I heard bullets whip past my ear and shouted, hit the dirt. What happened then is hard to remember. I was pinned down by mortar fire and machine gun bullets ripped the back of my jacket. My hands were burned and some shrapnel hit me. As I was lying down trying to sink into the dirt and flatten myself to the thickness of a piece of paper, I heard a German voice ordering his soldiers to shoot everyone on the ground that moved. The voices got closer and I felt that they were shooting us even though we were mobilized by firing and would have surrendered. At that time I decided I had a better chance if I stood up as the Germans got closer than to lie down and be killed anyway. I don't know what plan I had in my head, maybe to jump a German, maybe to surrender. It didn't matter. For as I stood up, I faced a Nazi SS officer who shot at me point blank and missed. It was lucky that I had no weapons on me at the time. I was wearing a red cross on my left arm because I was the medic for my unit, a non-commissioned uh, medical officer uh, for the gliders and paratroopers who was not a physician. I decided to brazen it out, and I was the French-German interpreter for our division, and I said in my best German, since when does the German Wehrmacht shoot at the red cross? The SS Nazi lieutenant saluted me and said, Nimels, never. You are now my prisoner. I tried to help my squad and commanding officer who was gravely injured uh, beside me, but they would not let me even look at any of the wounded or dead. Most of the squad except my driver seemed to be gone. Of course, knowing that my captor was an, uh, an SS Nazi did not make me feel very secure or happy. We, the surviving members of the glider squad, were marched back to a farmhouse still in Nazi hands and put into the barn and locked in. I realized uh, that they appeared to be uh, anxious, and I realized their anxiety since as we stood there walking into the barn, I saw hundreds of planes and gliders flying overhead. 
When they put us into the barn, my problems became acute. I had in my possession a map with all the coordinates of the landing zones of every parachute company of every battalion of the 82nd Airborne Division. I had this information since I was cleared as the top secret bigot soldier for my unit. Unfortunately, the map was printed with indelible ink on nylon, and eating a sheet of nylon does not work. I turned to my driver, who was the other guy alive with me, and asked, could I have a piece of your chewing tobacco? He was from West Virginia. His answer was, oh, come on, tribes, you don't use chewing tobacco. I answered, the hell I don't. I need some right now. So he gave me a stick of the stuff, and I began to chew it, and carefully and unobtrusively put the nylon map into my mouth with the tobacco. I chewed and chewed and chewed to the disgust of the Nazis watching us, and when I thought the map had been properly disguised by chewing tobacco guck, I spit the whole mess into the straw of the barn floor and covered it with my foot, hoping that the Germans did not see the map. They looked at me and called me bad names in German, which I of course knew, but did not examine the mess that landed under the straw. The landing zones were never discovered. That night we slept in the barn. Later I found out that this was uh, in St. Mary Glees, the first town liberated by the Allies, and actually by one of the units, the 505th Parachute Regiment of the 82nd Airborne. That night, the 505th actually captured the barn, but never looked inside. And the next day, the Germans counterattacked and recaptured the barn, with us in it. In the morning of D-Day plus one, still in the possession of the Germans, we were taken to the command post in a French chateau of the SS unit, and we were put into a cage and given bread, which was hard as nails, and water, which smelled like sewage. Somehow, we managed to convince the Nazis uh, that they were surrounded and would be doomed if they did not surrender. The German troops, who were mainly from Eastern Europe, wanted to stop fighting, but the SS were a different story. They wanted to shoot us, but a few paratroopers who had been captured elsewhere decided we had a better chance being angry and threatening them, and I guess our anger got across to the SS, and eventually they surrendered, of all things, to me with the Red Cross. We, the few Americans, now had the possession of a French chateau with more than 200 German and Nazi SS prisoners. I was in the corner of the chateau with 200 Lugers at my feet. The American 4th Division coming in from the beach was directly attacking the chateau, and the battleship Texas, go Navy, in the English Channel was firing 14-inch shells or 16-inch shells. I really didn't know. Thank heavens for the old stone walls of the chateau. Somehow we had to convince the Americans that American soldiers were now captors and held the chateau, not the Germans. The 4th Division did not believe us. In their attack from Utah Beach, they had repeatedly encountered Germans who waved a white flag of surrender only to open fire on advancing troops. It became increasingly evident that we had to stop the 4th Division before they terminated us. One paratrooper discovered a bugle. The only tune he knew how to play was a very bad version of the St. Louis Blues. This vignette will never leave me. Here I am in the corner of a chateau watching some crazy American playing the St. Louis Blues while the battleship Texas is blasting away at the chateau and the 4th Infantry is acting as if they want to kill every living thing in the fortress. The 4th Division was not having any of the bugle playing and the shelling and firing became worse and closer. Finally, I do not know where he came from and how he managed to do this, but a soldier found an American flag, wrapped it around his body, and ran in front of the fire. All the shooting stopped as an officer or NCO shouted, hold your fire. As the American 4th, I think it was Company L, moved into the chateau, they were very wary, but they soon discovered we were in control. The commanding officer of the 4th Division finally arrived, and we were designated to march the German prisoners back to Utah Beach. As we marched the supermen back, I must say I felt a little proud and glad to be alive. At the beach, no one knew where the 82nd Airborne Division was, the landing zones were all over the place, and I really did not have to eat that chewing tobacco. <laughs> My minor wounds were dressed at an aid station, and the medical officer asked me if I needed anything else. I said, yes, please, do you have two aspirins? Oh, are your wounds painful? No, sir, but I have a splitting headache. This was a long day. I finally found my division on D-Day plus three and joined them as we held back a German counterattack for 30 days. How many we lost, I do not know, but our ranks were very thin when we returned to base in Britain. 
D-Day was one of many days and one of many assaults, but it is one I have never forgotten. Sometimes I feel as if I was just an observer watching myself and others acting out a part in a large play. I try to make it sound funny, but it is the only way to maintain your sanity. I also know how lucky I am and have been especially to be able to tell my children and grandchildren this story 50 years later. So every person in this room has a story and I think it's our job to listen to those stories and stay connected and especially for the young people coming home now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber, for sharing that story. Um, some of you may have heard our next singer perform at prior events here at Bay State, and I am excited to introduce Charles Red, RN, Assistant Unit Manager of Wesson 4, who will be performing Letters from Home. A dear son, it's almost June. I hope this letter catches up with you and finds you well. It's been dry, but they call it for rain. And everything's the same old same in Johnsonville. Your stubborn old daddy ain't said too much. But I'm sure you know he sends his love. And she goes on.
Thank you, Charles. I'm also delighted to introduce our next performer. It's Lynette Johnson, Training Specialist of Access Services. She will actually be reading an original poem that she wrote special for today's event. This poem is entitled, For the Soldiers. For the ones who made it home, I often find myself wondering, do you marvel at your own bravery? Did you know for sure tomorrow would come? Did you daydream about the love of your life? Did they send you letters? Did you save them? Did you miss your mama's cooking? Do your children know Superman and Wonder Woman are not nearly as amazing as you are? I believe determination is a superpower. You must have needed a lot of that. Do they give that to you when you enlist? Or do you need to bring your own? When you pledged allegiance, you meant that with all of yourself. When it was too dark or too noisy, did you meditate on scripture? Is there a song you would hum when you were scared? Did you know we were scared too? We did not always understand why you had to be there. Did you have any idea how tremendous a sacrifice you were making? Did you know we were proud? I imagine you saw things you wish you could unsee. Do you think about it daily? Do you try not to? We applaud you. We salute you. We thank you. Even though those two words all by themselves feel paltry, thank you, not really good enough. You did what you did so we could do what we do. Where were you when they were teaching us to run away from danger? You must have missed that lesson. I hope it was all worth it for you. We try really hard to be decent citizens. We work and we vote and we want better for our children than we had for ourselves. We recognize your valor has made all of the difference. There is a special place in our prayers for you. I believe there should be a special place everywhere for you. You make this place special for us. God blessed America when he made you. We can call this the land of the free because it is home of the brave. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you, Lynette. Well, our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Arnstein, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Um, Dr. Arnstein also served in the U.S. Army from 1986 until 1996. Welcome. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak today. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes uh, giving a little bit of a tribute to military medicine in general since we're, uh, we're all engaged in that area uh, of health care. Uh, let me first say thank you to John for flying the C-130s because in the Army, we use those as our transportation from place to place, and we like to have a trustworthy driver. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Mike, for your work in the Navy, because we took care of the Marines uh, when they were front and center, uh, always first. So I appreciate that. This is a picture of Walter Reed General Hospital on a postcard. This, uh, this hospital was the first 80 bed, it was an 80 bed, the largest of its type at the time in 1908, government medical facility, really the first one. Uh, named after, of course, uh, uh, Major Walter Reed of uh, infectious disease fame. This is that building, Building 1, on the campus of Walter Reed, which, as you know, is in north, uh, the northwest section of D.C., almost on the Silver Spring Line in Maryland, but right over the D.C. line. It's actually on the site where the Confederate General Jubal Early in 1864 uh, launched his sniper raids on the uh, federal government. Uh, they put a hospital there about 40 years later, and that was building one. Uh, and I have about a 50 year connection to Walter Reed. I was there for 10 years, uh, but I'll tell you about the connection. This institute is the, this is the Institute of Research, which is about 20 yards behind that hospital. And this is where all the research went on in the United States uh, Army. Uh, medical research, and it's actually the, the list of accomplishments you'd, you'd be shocked. Chlorination of water, several vaccines, uh, some of which I'll talk about, uh, 
The uh, nutritional cause of beriberi was deciphered there. Uh, lots of other great stuff over its 100-year history. This is where my connection begins. My father's on, on, uh, on your right, uh, to the far right. Uh, this is in 1961, when this group was the first group in the world to isolate the German measles virus, the rubella virus. Uh, that's Colonel Busher on the left, uh, his commanding officer. This is the Division of Communicable Diseases at, uh, at the Institute of Research. My father trained with a guy named Louis Weinstein, who Dr. Kerouac knows well because he also trained with him. Uh, my father was his first fellow in a day when infectious diseases really didn't exist as a, as a known specialty. And uh, he got drafted like every other doctor in the late 50s, and they all got sent to San Antonio for basic training. Um, and they realized then that my dad was uh, an expert in viruses and an expert in bacteria and knew a lot about vaccines. And uh, Weinstein called Busher, and Busher went down to Texas, grabbed him, and brought him up to Walter Reed, and everyone else in that basic training class got sent overseas, uh, many to Korea, which had recently ended its conflict. The guy in the middle is Paul Parkman, who, uh, after they discovered rubella, he built the first rubella vaccine in the late 60s. And this is him on a cold winter day, which every day was at Fort Dix in New Jersey, uh, when Fort Dix was an active uh, facility. And... Uh, where they used to go to test soldiers doing vaccine research, and this was during the, the meningococcal vaccine work, which ended in the first successful meningococcal vaccine against uh, group A and group C meningitis that was developed by the Army. And this is me several years later in basic training. Uh, this is at lovely Fort Devens. Uh, which I guess is no longer a fort, but it was back then. And uh, we used to train with the nursing students, which was awesome. And <laughs> so this is the connection to Walter Reed. In the, in the background is the original hospital, and the foreground is the hospital I trained at, which was built and opened in 76. Went from 80 beds to 990 beds. Uh, 990 filled beds, and we had huge problems with patient progress, I should just tell you right <laughs> off the bat. At 2 in the morning, at 2 in the morning, the Met MOD, which was one of the senior medical people, would get a call to go down to the ER to admit 47 patients who just got off a plane from Germany via Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, so we had our problems. And that's a young army officer uh, just landed in 1986 with his uh, relatively recent bride uh, in the little townhouse. And that's what the hospital looked like, again, on the site where Jubal Early attacked the government. Right to, to the left there is the, is the cluster of old buildings, and behind that is the research building, uh, and behind that is the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. So we had great fertile grounds for training, a huge hospital, uh, and it was home to a lot of VIPs. There was actually a unit called Unit 72 on the seventh floor where the CIA had an outpost, and as the chief resident, I got to go in. It was my job to take care of the VIPs, presidents from other countries, senators, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, I remember going up there, and it was the only place where a struggling chief resident would go up there and the manager of the unit would come over with a teacup with china and a cup of coffee and hand you a nice cup of coffee. That's on advanced casualty training down in uh, Fort Sam, which I'm sure many in the audience have done. And again, the days when we were chief residents, and that's my associate program director who's an oncologist, uh, living the good life. And uh, just a couple of comments. So this is a, a poster the Army put out uh, several years ago, spanning its 200-year history. Um, and you can see that starting with General George Washington in 1777, but right under 1970, my dad then was a civilian. He, was, he spent three years as active duty, got out uh, of the Army, went back to Tufts. The plan was to, to take over for Louis Weinstein got called a year later by his former boss that he would be to come down as a civilian, rejoin him, stay as a civilian, because my father needed to get out of the military at that point, but stay as a civilian and 
uh, run the show at the Institute of Research, so it was an offer he couldn't pass up. So that group developed the first meningococcal vaccine and, and isolated rubella, culminating 200 years of Army medical history that goes on to this day. And the one thing, I, I took two things from that experience, two huge things. One was that um, what we did as military, uh, military medicine uh, and as military health care providers is the same thing we do today, basically. We took care of everyone. We never asked any questions about, we never had to ask any questions about insurance, those of us on the front lines providing care. Uh, we never worried about those things. We just took care of the people in front of us and their families, and these were not only active duty, but veterans, dependents, VIPs, foreign nationals, and anyone who got hurt or got sick uh, where we were the closest hospital. And the second thing I learned, which again, I, I've taken with me, I've never, uh, the fondest memories of never having been in such a strong culture at work, where every day you were at work and we had politics just like everyone else has politics, maybe worse than everybody else. But every day you, you were at work with other people doing the same work for the same goals, lots of different disciplines. Uh, and at the end of the day, we, we felt great about it. We had a real esprit de corps about the work we were doing. And that's what, uh, ever since, I've, I've sought to uh, recapitulate wherever I've gone. And, and I think this is the kind of place we can do that. And I thank you again for this event and for having me. Thank you, Dr. Arnstein. So we would now like to recognize all our veterans. Please stand. Thank you for your service. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize any family members of those who have served. So if you're a family member, would you please stand? Thank you all for your support. Um, so I would formally like to introduce Jim DiDonato, Manager of Information Security and Secretary of the BH Honor Guard, um, and also a former member of the U.S. Navy. Former member, that was a very long time ago. Dr. Artenstein left out perhaps the best photo that he had of all those photos. Was that you with a snake wrapped around your neck? Sure. Some, kind of, <laughs> some kind of boa constrictor. It should have been there. <laughs> There's always next year, yes. The Honor Guard leadership um, would like to thank members of the CCC, that's Bay State's Caring with Cultural Competence, ERG, um, for helping us stage this event today. There are so many people, and, and Mike has already thanked many people, but we have a couple we want to thank. And, and certainly all those, those folks, veterans and non-veterans, that participated in the program but for those of you that are not veterans that came to see us today to recognize us the day and maybe in memory of, of some family member, um, you're our very special friends. Thank you for coming. This is terrific that you're here. Finally, a big thank you goes out to the diversity and inclusion group. Those folks are terrific, especially John and C. Wood. Um, she yeah. deser they deserve a big round of applause, so please give it up. Stand up, John and C. Wood. The veterans in the room who are not yet members of the Honor Guard, you're being invited, just like the poster, the old Uncle Sam poster, we want you <laughs> to join the Honor Guard. Please, you, you'd be more than welcome. And family members are not left out. Family members of veterans are also welcome and eligible to join the Honor Guard. You may, it may be the employee at Bay State that's not a veteran and their veteran is at home or elsewhere. You are welcome to join us, perhaps for support, collaboration, some fun times perhaps if we're lucky. But please, 
if either of you two groups, the veterans that are not already members or the family members, would like to find out more about it, you can you're certainly welcome to come to a meeting or, or call us, contact us. Um, there's an information sheet in the back of the room. In the packets, in the packets, great. John and C is on top of it, see? <laughs> Use that information to contact us, and, and you're more, well, more than welcome to join. Now for the pre presentation of the challenge coin. What is the challenge coin, you may ask? A challenge, and I did not know this. Maybe I was in the service too long ago, and maybe it's something new. A challenge coin is a small coin or medallion bearing an organizational insignia or emblem carried by the organization, its members. Traditionally, they're given to prove membership when challenged and, and to enhance morale. In addition, they were also used, collected as, as mementos by service members. In practice, challenge coins are normally presented by unit commanders in recognition of service. And they're also exchanged in recognition of visits to an organization. The, the Honor Guard leadership would like today to present uh, the, the challenge coin to Mike Moran, Dr. John Schreiber, Andy Artenstein, and this represents, this coin will represent all the military branches of our service men and women. Thank you. One final comment. At the conclusion of the program, when the, the discussions are over today, we're inviting veterans to remain afterwards for a photo, another photo op. Thank you very much. So to close out the program, we would like to call um, Rosa Lopez up to do the moment of silence and benediction. Thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be here and close this service with a prayer. But before that, we would like to invite you for the moment of silence. Let us pray before we dismiss this service. God of the universe, today is a very special day, a day when we want to thank you for all the gifts and the diversity that brought us together as a community. As a community to remember and bring honor to all those who have laid their lives in the service of their country our country, and to those that at this very moment are in the front lines protecting our countries and protecting our borders. May the Lord bless you and keep this nation. May his spirit shine in our land and be gracious to us. May he keep our going in and our coming out. May he continue to bless the land of the brave and bring peace to our communities, to our nation, and to our world. God, we pray, bless America.
So please rise for the retiring of the colors. Thank you everyone for coming to today's event and sharing with us.